from the Japanese translation. What? One possible reason for the mission could be found in the basic stance of the Jesuits regarding the question of predestination. Itself based on Ignatius Loyola's understanding of the issue. In his spiritual exercises, Loyola added a list of rules as this. The 14th rule, it is granted that there is much truth in the statement that no one can be saved without being predestined and without having faith and grace. Nevertheless, great caution is necessary in our manner of speaking and teaching about all these matters. The 15th rule, we ought not to fall into a habit of speaking much about predestination. But if somehow the topic is brought up on occasions, it should be treated in such a way that ordinary people do not fall into an error. It sometimes happens when they say, it is already determined whether I shall be saved or damned. And this cannot now be changed by my doing good or evil. The term predestinatio was associated with the Calvinist doctrine, denying the necessity of good works and emphasizing salvation by God's grace alone. In addition, an ongoing controversy within the Catholic Church provided other reasons to shy away from the term. That is, a continuous debate of a free will, grace, and predestination. For example, the debate between Michel Bayus and Jesuit Leonard Lessius, or the debate that culminated in the Congregatio de Axiris between the Dominican Domingo Banich and the Jesuit Luis de Molina. Where the Jesuit championed the theology of sufficient praise, the Dominicans thought the doctrine to be incompatible with God's omniscience and infinite mercy. The chapter in question was not in conflict with Catholic teachings, as the Church had already sanctioned grandmother's original book. Therefore, the omission is suggesting just how sensitive the Jesuits in Japan were to the word predestination. Also, it is interesting that while in Europe the warning of Loyola was overlooked in no more than 10 years after his death, Jesuit abroad observed, uh, observed their founder's message faithfully and consequently. Another explanatory reason for the Jesuits' omission comes from the local Japanese situation. The Jesuit visitor Alexander Barignan, <coughs> who closely observed religions and factions among Japanese, reported that the Buddhist sect Ikoshu, literally means the sect of the single-minded, was the most numerous of all branches of Buddhism. He concluded that its teachings resembled those of Martin Luther. In order to better obtain the grace of the Japanese and for the sect to be accepted more easily, it is facilitated people's salvation and even came to say that exhorting the mercy and great uh, exhorting the mercy and great love that Amida and Shaka have for them, and that regardless of how much one sins, one remains purged and clean from every sin by provoking their names and trusting firmly in them and their merits without the need of doing other penitents from other works. Because with these deeds, one would insult the penitents and the works that they in turn did for saving humans. Therefore, they are appropriate teaching the doctrine of Luther. In this situation, it is only natural that translating and mentioning the theme of predestination in a Japanese edition could have evoked the equal Lutheran association among Japanese novices. <coughs> Therefore, 
they may have decided to omit the whole chapter. Okay, now I move to the section two. Okay, that consists of the main part of my presentation. I have already mentioned that the number of texts available for the comparative, comparative research is very limited. But happily enough, in the past 20 years, at least two new documents in this area have been discovered. One is manuscript and the other is a published book. One of the new texts, the Compendium Catholicae Veritatis, is a three-part astronomy, philosophy, and theology work written for use as a textbook at the Jesuit College. The second section of this book, which is on philosophy, is an outline of the third book of Aristotle's The Anima. The Japanese version was discovered in 1997, and since then, several monographs and articles related to it have been produced. Another relevant document, symbol of a fed, or fides no kill, was discovered in 19, uh, 2009. Uh, it is a Japanese translation of the first section of Luis de Granada's Introduction de la Symbol de la Fe, uh, as I have already mentioned. These two works share a certain tendency. In other words, a difficult to understand philosophical explanation of the intellective or rational soul was added during translation. And this theory of the soul is used to lead to the conclusion that the soul is immortal. In short, the added content contains a philosophical explanation of the intellective soul, which is generally described as, quote, the main soul of humans that makes humans the lords of creation, unquote. This intellective soul is one of the three traditional souls, the other two being the vegetative soul and the sensitive soul. Describing the excellence of and non-materiality of the intellective soul, which contains the intellect that is unique to humans, these texts discuss the immortality of the soul. The discussion then turns to the reasons that the soul is immortal, with the text stating the following. The virtue of justice is characterized by the reward of the good and the punishment of the wicked. And so, Deus is by no means unsparing when it comes to rewarding and punishing. However, when we look around the world today, it seems that few good people are rewarded and few wicked people are punished. And this can be the cause for doubt. Is the virtue of justice not present in Deus? In conclusion, this is, evidence, uh, this is evidence for the existence of an immortal animal. If there is to be full virtue of justice, then all punishments and rewards must ultimately, uh, ultimately be it up. If not in this world, then in the next. If punishment and rewards are to be received in the next world, then it follows that humans must have an immortal animal. Thus, if you know theirs, then the immortal existence of the anima will be self-evident. The reason that the soul is immortal is that it must exist as a subject of punishment and reward in the next life. In other words, the next world exists as a place that resolves the contradiction of this world, in which bad people are praised and good people are poor and suffer. This is how the added section on the immortality of the soul concludes. This reasoning is also found in the Compendium Catholica Veritatis. Yeah, but uh, because of the time, I have to skip to read. A Jesuit 
father and professor Shinzo Kamura, who researches on this compendium from a Japanese intellectual history perspective, explains the reason why this content was added. He firstly highlights the difference between the native religion of Ikoshu, the Buddhism sect that I have already mentioned, and Catholic doctrine. If these two religions, in, the, in, in these two religions, there is a difference in interpretation as to whether human religious salvation depends on self-power or one's ethical action or other power or the overwhelming grace of the supreme, uh, grace of the supreme. Kawamura points out that this is the very reason at which Catholicism appealed to Japanese people at that time. In other words, in the belief in the absolute as of power in the teaching of Ikoshu, it is hard to inspire ethical awareness and the aspiration to live a better life. So, missionaries attempted to encourage ethical aspiration for Japanese people by using the Christian doctrines of the idea of a reward and punishment which connects this life and the next life, and the notion of the immortality of the soul as a subject that receives this reward and retribution. The Society of Jesus is known for the detailed observation of the situation and human psychology in the societies in which they worked. Since the Society of Jesus sought method that accommodated the lifestyles of local people, Kawamura's conclusion that this way of explaining the immortality of the soul was primarily devised by coming into contact with the local church, the local culture of Japan, looks very convincing. Did the method of explaining the immortality of the soul using reward and punishment as an extra life as an aid really arise as a result of Jesuits adapting their teachings to Japan and Japanese people? In other words, was it actually an invention of the Jesuit in Japan? <coughs> I ask this because the immortality of the soul and the pros and cons of trying to defend the idea based on the ethical necessity of reward and punishment in the next life were already being debated in Europe at that time. Today, I would like to focus on one participant in that debate, Pietro Pombonazzi. Through his efforts to the philosophical study of Aristotle, Pietro Pomponazzi arrived at the conclusion that the immortality of the soul cannot be proven by an Aristotelian approach. This conclusion clearly contradicted Christian teaching. Therefore, when Pomponazzi's seminal work on the immortality of the soul was published in 1516, it was met with a barrage of criticisms and the author was suspected of heresy. However, in the same book, Pomponati states that while in the immortality of the soul might not be the truth, it can nevertheless be considered a teaching that is conduct conducive to social justice. He makes this claim in chapter 14, arguing that it is appropriate to sacrifice truth for the common social good. In other words, giving precedence to ethical aims over logical investigation. I read. As Plato and Aristotle say, the statesman is the Swedish of souls, and the purpose of the statesman is to make man righteous rather than learned. Now, according to the diversity of men, one must proceed by different devices to attain this end. The device that Pomponats present 
should make humans realize that there is no contradiction between the severe reality of this life and God's justice in the world. Namely, this device entails the idea of punishment and reward in next life, and the immortal soul as the subject of this punishment and reward. He explains this theory in the following way. I read. Therefore, they have set up for the virtuous eternal rewards in another life and for the vicious eternal punishment, which frighten greatly. And the greater part of them, if to say good, do it more from fear of eternal punishment than from hope of eternal good, since punishments are better known to us than that eternal good. The lawgiver, regarding the proneness to man to evil, intending the common good, has decreed that the soul is immortal, not caring for truth, but only for righteousness, that he may lead man to virtue. He also states the following, nor the statesman to be blamed, for just as physician feigns many things to restore sick man to health, so the statesman composes fables to keep the citizens in the right path. But in these fables, there is, proper speaking, neither truth nor falsity. So also nurses bring their charges to what they know to benefit children. But if a man were highly or of sound mind, neither physician nor nurse would need such fictions. Here, he declares that the immortality of the soul is a fiction that leads all humans to the way of morality despite having no theoretical basis. In other places, Mombonazzi also uses the word figmenta or invention in the same context. While this appears to be a rather bold declaration, Pomponazzi wants to say that the immortality of the soul is not the truth but is valid as justice, that is not correct as natural philosophy, sorry, is not correct as natural philosophy but that it's valid as humans. One could also say that while it is not truth, it becomes reality by humans living it. On the other hand, after Componatic's assertion that the soul is mortal appeared, theologians were for the first time forced to prove the correctness of Christian doctrine using philosophical techniques in the same way that Componatic did. The Jesuit of the Coimbra School led the charge to do so. They declared this attitude through their creation of commentaries on Aristotle's various works, known as the Coimbra Commentaries. Charles Lohr states, in its reaction to Pomponazzi, the Jesuit form of Aristotelianism had become conscious of the Jesuit itself. Also, M. De Michel says that the philosophical discussion rejecting Pomponati's assertion continued until the mid 17th century. However, when carrying out missionary work abroad, the Jesuits actually used his argument for the benefit of propagating Christian teaching. <coughs> so I'll have to skip to the conclusion. I hope this presentation has caught your attention to the flexibility of the conversion measures of the Jesuits, as well as to their intellectual context. As a first conclusion, while criticisms of Pomponati being repeated in Europe, the Jesuits in Japan calculatingly decided to explain the immortality of the soul using his ethical and humanistic method. This fact clarifies the paradoxical position of the Jesuits. While at home, in Europe, they were severe critics of Pomponazzi, abroad they became active promoter of his humanistic or ethical statement. As a second conclusion, 
The Jesuit flexibly used Componenti's claim that the immortality of the soul is not truth but reality. This can be seen as a double truth or a skillful switch from a demonstrative argument to a probable argument. In closing, as a third conclusion, I would like to make the following overall claim by putting this fact back into the historical context of Japanese Christian history. The reality that Japanese believers became martyrs one after another based on their belief in the immortality of the soul and their hope in the next life was ideal material for asserting the justifiability of this probable argument back in Europe. This enables us to understand the hidden meaning, hidden reason why Jesus so repeatedly and proudly mentioned in reports to Rome that Japanese people show a particular interest in the immortality of the sun. That is all I have to say. Thank you very much.